So a little background on theory for everyone. And I promise this will not be boring. This is one of the, uh, the things, uh, for lack of a better word, that does make the book rather different. I, I underpin most of my argumentation in classical strategic theory. The man up there in the top right corner is Carl von Clausewitz, uh, who reminded us in his great book uh, on war, war is merely the continuation of policy by other means. Some of you may have heard of this before. Uh, it is part and parcel with uh, current Western thinking about war. By the way, Sun Tzu, the great Eastern philosopher of war, says essentially the same thing. Uh, though Clausewitz was not translated into English until after the war, the basic premise that you don't make war unless there's a political object in mind was understood by the principal leaders of both the Union and the Confederacy, and Robert E. Lee very clearly inculcated this. Uh, he understood that there was a political purpose to the entire war, uh, to Confederate bids for independence, and Jackson also understood this in his own way. And so this understanding here of the uh, significance of, of what war is about underpins our entire discussion tonight. It isn't war for war's sake. There isn't an attempt to get into the North by Lee and Jackson just to terrorize the Northern population. The great end or objective, as indicated by one of the legs of the uh, red stool there, is to achieve Confederate independence uh, through whatever means and ways necessary. So ends, very briefly, folks, are what you're fighting for in a war. What are your primary objectives, your, your primary goals? Uh, the means are all of the things that you have to actually utilize to get to your ends. And uh, often they're considered resources, but I would have you think beyond uh, just men, money, and material here. Think also in terms of leaders as important means for a country at war, whether that be in the Civil War or whether that be today. And means are finite. Lee and Jackson both understood the Confederacy was running out of means. They got that as early as 1861 independently. And when they came together uh, in uh, the Great Partnership, as I call it, uh, they put their heads together on how best to utilize the dwindling means of the South to try to still achieve the end of independence. And it's that putting of heads together, if you will, that describes the process of ways or concept creation. Uh, these are the ideas and the concepts and the execution thereof that connect the means to the ends. Uh, in many ways, you could argue that the ways are themselves the essence of strategy. The Marines certainly argue that in a lot of their doctrine today. If you get the concepts and the ways wrong, it doesn't matter how wonderful your means are or how grand your ends may be, uh, you won't be able to connect the ends and the means and your war effort will fail. And this was part of the problem for the Union war effort in the East in the first couple years of the war. Uh, the ways, how they tried to utilize their means to achieve the ends of the war uh, were bungled. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Jackson and Lee together thought very proactively and productively, I would argue, about Confederate ways to best utilize their weaker means to achieve their primary goal of Confederate independence. So we'll talk more about ends, ways, and means. Underneath, you see that little dime, and uh, that is an acronym. In the military, we love our acronyms. I apologize for that, but we do. Uh, but one, this one's simple. And uh, the uh, ideas of the elements or the instruments of national power are represented by this acronym, the DIME, Diplomatic, Informational, Military, and Economic. I mentioned this up front because both of these commanders understood the other aspects of war making in the 19th century besides the military. Uh, and they understood that time was ticking against the Confederacy, more importantly, in the three besides the big M, as I call it. Uh, and therefore, the pressure was on them, Lee particularly understood this, to achieve something in the military instrument to compensate for the failures in the other three. Uh, and uh, again, time is a factor here. Uh, as Confederate bids uh, f diplomatically begin to fail in Europe, especially after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, Lee begins to understand all of this is going to be on his head, uh, and 
even the military situation in the Western theater has deteriorated to a point uh, that uh, it's all going to be on him and on his command team in the Army of Northern Virginia. And of course, we're all familiar with the economic weaknesses of the Confederacy uh, intrinsically uh, that, that they're facing, uh, which were not helped very much by poor Confederate fiscal policy. The levels of war. I promised I would mention these, and some of these terms may be familiar to you, but it's important for us to differentiate among the three. In the 19th century, the uh, future commanders of the Civil War who were educated at West Point or at the Citadel or at VMI would have gotten a very basic watered down version of this, uh, uh, of this understanding of the three levels and how they interact. They all tended to get the idea, and particularly the better leaders on both sides, that you could have a nexus, if you will, among the three levels of war, uh, i.e., there could be a moment in time, particularly a tactical level battle event, in which the entire campaign could be decided and even the course of the war might be influenced. And we often think about the Battle of Gettysburg and certain moments uh, therein that uh, would qualify for such, a, such an award. There were many other battles uh, prior to Gettysburg in which the Lee Jackson command team participated in uh, where this also was the case. And I outline that in the book, particularly in the seven days, there were opportunities uh, to utterly destroy George McClellan's Army of the Potomac, but it was bungled. And Jackson did have something to do with the bungling. Uh, and later on, there were other opportunities, uh, uh, such as at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, where a great deal of damage could have been done tactically that would have had an effect, perhaps even at the strategic level. And this little triangle that has just appeared gives you an idea of the kind of leadership required at each level. Again, <clears throat> strategic level leadership is war winning and war losing leadership. And this relates to the ends ways means paradigm. There are only so many leaders in any given war effort, whether it be in the Civil War, whether it be today, who actually can think and execute at the strategic level. And notice, folks, that most strategic level leaders, then as today, have to descend sometimes down to the tactical level to directly oversee events in battles, uh, because that sometimes is necessary for good leaders to do. And we see this often with Robert E. Lee for example, in the famous wilderness incident, uh, when he has to uh, lead the Texans onto the field and is, is sent to the rear. Uh, this happens a lot in the war for leaders on both sides, uh, and strategic leaders have to get used to doing that. The problem is they risk themselves, as Jackson did at Chancellorsville for the last time, and often uh, they fall victim to mishaps. There are only so many of those kinds of leaders for any country in any war. The Confederacy had a smaller bench than the Union did, so they can't afford to lose these guys. There are far more organizational level leaders, or those that are great at leading corps, uh, those that are, are great at, at, at campaigning for both sides in the Civil War uh, and today. They too, though, are numbered. There aren't going to be loads of them uh, for either side, and the Confederacy finds itself uh, hard-pressed even for them. Uh, by the end of 1863. Lee is very acutely aware that he's running out of great organizational level leaders too. And direct leadership generally applies at the tactical level. We're talking about uh, fighting in battles. These are the brigade and the regimental commanders. Uh, occasionally though, you will see strategic level leaders have to operate tactically, which Lee and Jackson also did. So you see direct leadership extends up to the beginning of the strategic level as well. So there's the theoretical underpinning, I think, that will help us be equipped uh, for me to continue on here with uh, the rest of my discussion. So what was the national strategic situation just before the climactic Chancellorsville campaign, which knocks the great partnership apart uh, with the accidental shooting of Jackson in those dark woods on the evening of May 2nd, 1863? Well, it was the second full year of the war and the battles of Second Manassas, Antietam, and Fredericksburg, as you well know, have occurred. Uh, and Second Manassas and Fredericksburg were big Confederate wins, though incomplete, uh, not strategic level victories, very frustrating to Robert E. Lee. Antietam, a strategic check uh, 
a tactical draw and an operational uh, defeat for the Confederates, though we must not forget the 12,000 uh, Union prisoners that Jackson took at Harper's Ferry. That's often overlooked by scholars who are quick to point to uh, the strategic ramifications uh, of the Antietam campaign. Um, more on Antietam to come shortly. In the East, we could argue, therefore, the Confederates are slightly winning the war, uh, but slightly, with the Army of Northern Virginia's command team, which consists of Lee, Jackson, Longstreet, and of course, J.E.B. Stuart. So it's not just Lee and Jackson here, it's the synergy that exists in this command team that Lee first puts together uh, at the end of the seven days. And that synergy is very important because it was special. There was nothing else like it in any of the armies of the Union and the Confederacy at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, there was certainly nothing that the Army of the Potomac had at that time that could match it. So it's important to realize that Lee and Jackson's relationship exists in a professional sense within this synergy of the greater command team of the Army of Northern Virginia. And when that command team is disrupted, that will bode bad things for Confederate chances, indeed for the fate of the entire Confederacy. And the reason for that isn't just because of what's going on in Virginia, but because of what's happening in other theaters of war. Vicksburg is threatened by this point, though it's not yet under siege. Tennessee is two thirds fallen to the Union, Missouri all but lost, and Arkansas and Louisiana are one half occupied uh, by uh, Union forces. So in the West, it's very clear the United States is winning the war. And the blockade of Southern ports by the US Navy is really taking a toll uh, on uh, Confederate imports from Europe and their ability to export the cotton, uh, which was already badly damaged by some bad policies like King Cotton uh, earlier in the war. Moreover, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, is helping the Union diplomatically and informationally. Uh, especially in Europe, because it's essentially making Britain and France look at the Confederacy as a pariah country, particularly after those two empires had emancipated their slaves decades before. So uh, it's going to be a big deal for England and France after emancipation to do anything close to recognizing Confederate independence, let alone interfering in the Civil War, because they would then be aiding a slaveholding republic and be facing a great deal of uh, backlash back home in Europe. Uh, so clearly the Union is winning through most of the aspects of the dime, diplomatically, informationally, and economically, and it's halfway winning the M. Uh, that's not good for Confederate prospects. Lee and Jackson know this. They know they've got to do something. Uh, and they want to do something to help remedy this massively deteriorating situation. Hooker however, is going to jump the gun on them and he's going to take the initiative in the East away from Lee. I will explain why that is shortly. Uh, and he will uh, uh, commence operations in the Eastern theater after the long winter of 62 to 63 uh, by outflanking Robert E. Lee west of Fredericksburg. And Lee will find himself outnumbered, outflanked two to one. And Longstreet is not there. He's on detached duty down near Suffolk uh, uh, in Southeast Virginia, uh, looking after Union uh, activities there and also gathering supplies because the Army in Northern Virginia is so logistically distraught. Uh, a sad state of, uh, a sad comment on the state of Confederate supply and logistics, even at this midpoint of the war. The next series of slides are going to show us uh, some uh, period photographs that were taken at various points throughout the conflict uh, or directly afterwards as also some period sketches. Uh, and they represent the successes of the Lee Jackson partnership up to April of 1863. And I have several chapters that talk about how the collaboration evolved and uh, how successful it actually was and, and what Lee and Jackson actually wanted to do. Well, Antietam, represented by these two uh, slides, these two pictures, which are taken directly out of my book, uh, Antietam was their first attempt to get into the North. And as we well know, it was stopped by George McClellan in the Army of the Potomac at Sharpsburg. Uh, but that was not the intent. The idea that Lee and Jackson both wanted was to get into Pennsylvania, as some of you well know. And of course, Pennsylvania feared this. Uh, and there was a great concern that this indeed would happen. 
what did they want to do there? Well, we know now that Jackson, from the earliest days of the war, wanted to get into the North and wreak havoc on Union logistics. And this strikes at one of my theses that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Jackson is thinking about strategic level Northern means, particularly Northern coal mines. And what he wants to do is burn out the principal Union uh, or, or Pennsylvania, I should say, anthracite coal mines that are located in a few counties just to the east of the Susquehanna River. Some of you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of them are in Schuylkill County. And uh, the reason Jackson knew about them is because one of his uh, staff members and his topographer, Jed Jedediah Hotchkiss, had lived in that area before the war, then went south before the Civil War breaks out, and sides with the Virginians uh, when uh, uh, the guns open up and Virginia secedes. And Hotchkiss told Jackson about the vulnerability, a strategic vulnerability that these coal mines represented. Uh, an earlier scholar uh, looked into exactly what this meant, uh, how much coal was being produced in these coal mines, and he came up with the uh, number 75% of all the Norse anthracite coal was coming out of these three coal mines uh, in uh, Schuylkill County and, and, and related uh, locations. And the inference was that if those coal mines were burned out, the Northern steamships for the blockade and the Northern locomotives delivering supplies to the Union armies in the South, indeed delivering Union armies themselves would come to a grinding halt. Jackson knew about this and he writes several times and speaks to many important people throughout the war. This has been in the historical record, but nobody really bothered to understand what it actually meant at the strategic level. They just uh, mentioned this, and not too many folks, by the way. What Jackson wanted to do was get in there and, and destroy these mines. Uh, moreover, he also wanted to uh, knock a hard blow at Harrisburg and hit the railroads hard there, which would have caused disruptions in Union command and control and communication. Uh, and the linkage between the eastern and western halves of the north, and he wanted to create political havoc for Abraham Lincoln, which is a Clausewitzian idea. As early as 1861, uh, he is uh, talking to the senior Confederate uh, leaders about this, uh, and in 1862, uh, he writes to Robert E. Lee, who is then Jefferson Davis's advisor in Richmond, uh, give me more men. I have just finished my successful Valley campaign, which you helped me with. Uh, send me more men and give me 40,000, in fact, and I'll be on the banks of the Susquehanna uh, in a matter of a week. And we'll transfer the seat of war from the James to the Susquehanna. He actually convinced Lee of this. And Lee sends a full division towards him, 7,500 men, but then has to recall it and Jackson because McClellan's getting too close to Richmond. That's all in the official records. Not a lot of folks have really understood what Lee wanted to do. And if you look at his responses to Jackson and indeed his dispatches to Davis that are in the official records, Lee comes right out and says, I think if we can reinforce Jackson and let him get into Pennsylvania, it'll quote, change the character of the war. Uh, which tells us that Lee is starting to believe Jackson's got some ideas even before the two have physically been brought together uh, to uh, participate in the seven days. After that happens, and Jackson's poor performance in the seven days, Lee kind of steps back a little bit, and he says, okay, Jackson had a bad time here, and he does lose some respect for Jackson's proficiency, which was recorded by none other than Jeb Stuart. Uh, and uh, Stuart and Jackson had gotten close in 1861 when Jackson was assigned to the Harper's Ferry garrison briefly before he was uh, transferred east uh, to deal with the first Manassas is issue. Uh, and uh, Stuart was a fairly reliable reporter of the relations between Lee and Jackson, by the way, uh, in the first two years of the war. Very interesting. He and, and, and Jackson were probably even closer than Lee and Jackson were. Again, the root is a strong religious underpinning. Stuart, a very strong Christian evangelical also uh, at the time. But Jackson's performance at Cedar Run helps vindicate his diminished reputation with Lee, and then his performance at Second Manassas really restores his credibility. And sometime before the the movement, uh, before the movement towards Second Manassas, I write in the book, 
Lee and Jackson must have sat down and there isn't a smoking gun, but there's a lot of smoke and discussed what they wanted to do, uh, that they did want to get into Pennsylvania. And so the transfer up towards uh, Washington was not just to, uh, to get the seat of the war moved out of Virginia and off the James uh, the River area, but it was also to start to get the Army Northern Virginia closer to Pennsylvania, which ultimately ends up happening after the victory at Second Manassas. Uh, and we do know that Lee and Jackson and Longstreet did have a conference in Leesburg after Second Manassas in which they planned what would become the Sharpsburg uh, or the, 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 the Maryland campaign, uh, which of course was still born. Uh, but that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to get into the North. Longstreet was okay with this, though he felt that he had been kind of left out in the dark a little bit. These are the Union commanders that were defeated by the Lee Jackson command, te command team, and we're familiar with these names. Uh, it's important to realize that uh, Lee thought George McClellan was his most formidable opponent. He wrote that after the war. It wasn't Grant. Uh, he thought McClellan was the most proficient and uh, his most uh, uh, difficult to defeat opponent. I find that rather interesting. Fitz John Porter, uh, who uh, is uh, defeated on the peninsula in one of McClellan's right hands. John Pope, of course, at Second Manassas. Ambrose Burnside, the general who realized he wasn't very good. You got to give him credit, by the way. Burnside knew he wasn't that good. Uh, I really give him uh, a lot of points for his EQ there. Defeated at Fredericksburg. Joseph Hooker, uh, at Chancellorsville, despite all of his promises, and Oliver Otis Howard, one of his core commanders uh, uh, at Chancellorsville, who received the brunt of Jackson's flank attack uh, in that climactic battle. Now here we see a representation of uh, some of the other major points in the book, the other theses. Uh, the religious aspect of Stonewall Jackson, I'd like to make a comment on that for everyone. He's often portrayed in the literature as being a religious fanatic. That, that, that is a, an exaggeration. Uh, there's no question that Jackson was a little bit further along on the, uh, on the, uh, the spectrum of, uh, of uh, belief in his, in, in, in his Christianity than many others. But a lot of Americans in the mid 19th century were very devoted and, and believing Christians at the time. Jackson was a little further off to the right on this, uh, but not so far uh, that he was uh, a crazy fool as, as some uh, eyewitnesses would regard him. Uh, none other than Abraham Lincoln and Oliver Otis Howard and uh, Salmon P. Chase uh, were also strong uh, uh, evangelical uh, and, and divine providence believing Christians. Uh, so Jackson was a little further along the line, but he wasn't a nutcase. And I want to make that, that case clear. The records make it clear. And how he speaks about God and about his faith uh, to his wife uh, and in his letters to Lee and in his dispatches to Richmond is, is very similar to how Lee himself uh, discusses uh, uh, the creator and discusses uh, uh, his faith. Uh, one difference is that Jackson believes just about everything is controlled by God and that human agency was not as strong and not as much of a, of a part of decision making. Uh, essentially, God gave the decisions to men in their heads, and so it was still pretty much all up to God. Uh, he gave a small credence to independent decision making by humans. Lee gave much more of a margin for that, uh, and you can see that in how they would uh, report on their battles. Uh, the glory all goes to God in Jackson's battle reports. The glory is shared with God and with his subordinates who did well in Lee's battle reports. Below you see Moss Neck Manor. That is a modern picture, by the way, uh, of the, uh, the plantation. It does still exist. It was on the grounds of Moss Neck Manor that uh, Jackson had his uh, winter headquarters after the Battle of Fredericksburg. And it was in there that uh, he started thinking about uh, trying again to get into Pennsylvania. And he asked Jedediah Hotchkiss, his map maker, to create uh, a map of the southern counties of Pennsylvania in anticipation of a spring campaign. That map exists at the Hanley Library in Winchester today. You can still see it. Uh, and uh, I was just interviewed about that, in fact, on uh, ABC 27, our, our local Harrisburg station. Uh, and uh, the Library of Congress has a copy of the map as well. During March, uh, February of, excuse me, February of 1863, late February and early March, 
Jackson and Lee uh, secret themselves in Lee's tent for three straight days. That is in Hotchkiss's diary. It's and also been corroborated by some of Stuart's uh, aides uh, in their wartime uh, reports and wartime letters. And we don't know what was said. There is no specific record of that Lee Jackson conversation. However, shortly after those three days of meetings were finished, Lee finds himself on a train to Richmond and has a conference with the Confederate National Command Authority. Now that meeting is often lost in the shuffle of all of the meetings in Richmond that happen after Chancellorsville preceding Gettysburg. But there was one in March. And if you look carefully at the official records, you will see evidence of it. You will also see a very uh, 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 indirect reference of it in uh, uh, Charles Wilson Reagan's um, uh, memoir, which is a bit hard to read at times, the Confederate Postmaster General. Uh, and in that conference, I believe that uh, Lee convinced uh, the Confederate leadership in the cabinet, Jefferson Davis, his boss, uh, that they needed to try to get into the North again. Uh, I find it very uncanny that he goes to Richmond right after he's talked to Jackson. Uh, and Jackson has commissioned this map just the month before uh, of uh, the southern counties of Pennsylvania. What were they going to do with that? I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, and so I make the case, again, there's a lot of smoke from a lot of different uh, wartime sources, not post-war lost cause inspired force, uh, sources, but sources at the time that indicate Lee and Jackson together were planning what would become the Pennsylvania campaign. Uh, and uh, I think were it not for the illness that Lee contracts while he is in Richmond, uh, he gets a very bad cold there. And the cold goes into his, uh, into his lungs and into his heart, makes him sick for uh, the rest of the winter and into April. That lays him out for the better part of a month. If it weren't for that, there's a good chance that they would have actually embarked upon uh, their campaign and gotten the jump on Joseph Hooker instead of vice versa. But Lee laying ill in the Yerby House, which was his headquarters, only a, a, a horse's ride away from Moss Neck, uh, uh, lying ill uh, prohibited Lee from being able to enact the plan he and Jackson had developed. And so uh, time is lost. Jackson is chomping at the bit. He visits Lee at the Yerby House, who knows what they said there. Uh, but I document this critical period, and Jackson is drilling his men for a rapid march at this time. He's issuing orders to his core, be prepared to march quickly, and these are the ways I want you to march. This was not preparation for the flank march at Chancellorsville. This was preparation for a much larger uh, endeavor, but it's not to be uh, because Lee will only recover in time to then be well enough to conduct a, a defensive campaign at Chancellorsville, which ultimately will result in his greatest moment, in Jackson's greatest moment, uh, but also uh, the darkest hour of the collaboration, which is the accidental shooting of Jackson uh, on the, the late evening of May 2nd, 1863, in front of his own lines by his own men. Here we see a map that tells us briefly what the uh, strategic imperatives facing the Confederacy were at the time. Number one, of course, is the crisis that's emerging along the Mississippi at Vicksburg. This was discussed in that March conference. The issue in Tennessee was ongoing. Uh, do we detach soldiers from Lee's army and send them to Braxton Bragg in Tennessee? Discussed in March as it would be later uh, in the famous May and June conferences that we well know. Uh, or do we do something in the Eastern Theater? Lee and Jackson had come by the spring, the early spring of 1863 to the conclusion that only in the Eastern Theater could the war be won only in the Eastern Theater could a deteriorating uh, situation across all the instruments of national power be salvaged. And uh, that was one of the reasons Lee went to Richmond in March to convince the command authority there, we've got to try now, or we might as well throw in the towel. It's going to be a tough road. Maybe we can try for the 64 election. You can only imagine they might have talked about that. There is no record of that uh, yet. Uh, however, uh, I think Lee still thought, and Jackson definitely supported him, that the war could be won militarily, but only in the Eastern Theater and only by them uh, and their command team. And so number three was chosen, but it will be delayed because of Chancellorsville. 
So to summarize the Lee-Jackson relationship on the 1st of May, 1863, Jackson was Lee's chief operator. Uh, part of that was because Longstreet was absent throughout the winter, uh, as I indicated earlier, and that did help the friendship of Lee and Jackson to grow because of the absence of Longstreet. I make the case, and I think it's pretty clearly supported by the historical record, that Jackson had superseded Longstreet as Lee's number one by this point. Jackson is Lee's chief strategic operational and tactical advisor by this point in the war, and they both wanted to bring the war into the North, hopefully to create a massive political and uh, strategic effect logistically. Jackson is one of Lee's few personal friends, and this friendship underpinned by the religious aspect uh, that they both shared uh, is an important component here, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, shortly. The relationship, of course, is built on the foundational professional trust undergirded by Christian faith. If Jackson had not redeemed himself after the seven days, uh, I think it's fair to say that this relationship would not have grown in the way that it did. But Jackson does well in the subsequent campaigns and restores Lee's faith in him. Jackson and Stuart are very close. Uh, this is important because it created another level of leadership underneath Robert E. Lee that Lee knew he could count on. And if you think about how many times Stuart and Jackson had collaborated prior to Chancellorsville, that gives you an idea. Uh, Second Manassas, and also uh, in the, the, the lead on to Second Manassas. And then uh, during the Antietam campaign itself, Stuart is holding Jackson's uh, left flank at Nicodemus Hill uh, there at Antietam. Um, the two are very, very good together. Uh, and that's also very significant for Robert E. Lee's command team. And of course, at Chancellorsville, uh, they will work the best together with the flank march. What did Jackson mean to the Confederacy in the spring of 1863? Well, he had a reputation as a successful general with the Confederate public, uh, and in fact was seen by that same public as significant as Robert E. Lee, as significant as Robert E. Lee uh, in the mind's eye of most Confederates. Uh, remember, his Valley campaign was a buoy of hope during a dark period of the war, and that escalated his reputation. Uh, and the bungling in the seven days was not reported in the, Confederate, in the Confederate press. In fact, Jackson was given accolades despite what he did or didn't do in the seven days. And so he just goes on from victory to victory in the opinion of the Confederate people. They also believed that his moral character made the cause righteous. Because he was such a Christian soldier, which was well known at the time, the cause must be a Christian cause. Now, this has undertones of foreboding. What happens if Jackson falls? Has too much faith been put in a pillar of flesh, which is what some of the, uh, the eulogies that go on across the South after his death actually refer to, uh, that Jackson was uh, built up as, a, as an idol uh, and uh, that this was offensive in God's eyes. Of course, Jackson would have been just horrified to have known this. Uh, the public did understand Jackson's value to Lee, though in a more vague sense. They didn't know how close the two men were. Uh, they didn't know his strategic value, but they did know that, that Jackson and Lee worked well together as a great team. He was viewed particularly as the protector of the Valley, that is by the Valley residents in Virginia. And he had a very strong and rising reputation within the Confederate government itself uh, that was not the case initially. Uh, his mess in the Romney campaign uh, that preceded his Valley campaign in the winter of 62, 61, 62, kind of gave him a black mark with Jefferson Davis. By the time of his death, uh, Jackson is very well redeemed in the eyes of Jefferson Davis uh, and, in fact, is seen as essential uh, uh, to the Confederate cause. More on that very shortly. Well, all of this was not to be because Jackson's going to die in the Chandler plantation, plantation office pictured there at the top uh, on May 10th after his accidental wounding. Uh, pneumonia set in or it was sepsis. We're not 100% sure what it was. He was suffering from a cold uh, before the, the wounding. Uh, and there were all kinds of uh, discussions at the time. You should see the source material on this about what actually killed Jackson from period letters? Was it the application of cold towels to his chest? Uh, was it uh, 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 the fact that uh, uh, 
he, he didn't take enough food or, or who knows. I personally think that it was the second fall from the litter being brought back to uh, the field hospital that did him in. Uh, the first fall was bad. The second fall, which was from shoulder height, uh, he fell on his bad side, the wounded side, and it probably caused a rib to puncture the lung. Uh, and that probably was what began the, the deterioration. Uh, on the bottom, you see the, the great uh, Hotchkiss map uh, that uh, I mentioned earlier that would be carried in the saddlebags of almost all of the principal commanders of the Army of Northern Virginia when they did get into Pennsylvania, but Jackson would not be among them. When Jackson died, the reactions across the Confederacy were pretty obvious. Uh, Robert E. Lee was positively devastated. The friendship between the two men was very important to Lee because Lee had very few personal friends in the Army of Northern Virginia. He had William Nelson Pendleton, and that's about it, besides Stonewall Jackson. Longstreet thought that, that Lee and, and he were close, but it was not the case. Uh, Lee did not think he was that close to Longstreet. Longstreet thought he was close to Lee. Uh, of course, he writes that 45 years later in his memoirs, uh, but Lee did not evince anywhere a close relationship to Longstreet like he had with Jackson. And the letters that he wrote uh, to his brother, to his son, who can fill his place I do not know, uh, for instance, was a frequent refrain. Uh, they indicate how absolutely devastated he was. Uh, and uh, he did issue General Order 61 to the Army in which he said, may his spirit be diffused across the Army to strengthen it. But it was a brave face uh, put on essentially to palliate the suffering of the Army and how badly the Army felt uh, all across the divisions, by the way, not just in Jackson's uh, command. Uh, Lee himself believed that his Army had been broken by the loss of Jackson. Uh, Pendleton uh, wrote quite a few letters to his wife during the war. They're preserved at the UNC um, archives down in uh, Chapel Hill. And uh, I found a letter that had never been seen before in which he wrote to his wife, I went into Lee's tent and we cried a great deal about Jackson. Uh, that tells you really just what a devastating loss this was personally for Robert E. Lee. And Lee, of course, knew professionally what this meant to his command team was now broken. In the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, officers and enlisted men said a variety of things. I, I looked over uh, about 200 different letters uh, in my research, and they said, uh, generally speaking, this was a national calamity. Most of them spoke about crying with the death of Jackson. This, by the way, going on for weeks in their letters uh, to loved ones at home. Uh, they wouldn't say it in every letter, but it was often a refrain. A couple of them were more stoic. Jedediah Hotchkiss, interestingly, wrote to his wife that God's will be done, but Hotchkiss was an evangelical Protestant too, like his boss. And so he kind of was able to say, well, okay, this is what God willed, so we're going to accept it and we're going to move on. Uh, but those that weren't as religiously inclined just took this extremely hard. Uh, one soldier, I, I'll never forget when I ran across this, he wrote, all hopes of peace and independence are vanished forever. This is after he participated in the victorious Chancellorsville campaign. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, just how badly the, the soldiers uh, took this. Uh, and again, it wasn't just in Jackson's command or in the Stonewall Brigade, it was across the army. Uh, in, uh, in Richmond, government officials also said it was a national calamity. That's what Jefferson Davis called it. And Secretary of War Seddon in a three page single space eulogy that he gave about uh, Jackson to the Confederate Congress and had put in the official congressional record, he said that uh, Jackson's loss is irreparable. Uh, we won't ever recover from this. In uh, Richmond and in uh, the Valley and other places in Virginia, a lot of the newspaper editors said something like this, he has fallen and a nation weeps. Uh, the uh, Richmond Dispatch and the Richmond Examiner pretty much said the same thing on this, and they kept saying it for several weeks. Uh, and then they got distracted, of course, by other things, but uh, it went on for a while. In the Deep South and in the Carolinas, it was interesting. They were even more affected, it seemed, than in Virginia. Uh, and uh, some of the editorials were extremely profound. One editor said, it was the most serious loss we have yet sustained in the war. Uh, national calamity was repeated. They probably heard that somehow from Jefferson Davis's aides and it got transmitted 
Uh, another editor said he was absolutely invaluable to the cause and we could not afford, excuse me, we could not afford to lose him. Uh, and uh, as far away as Mobile, Alabama, one uh, uh, commenter said, universal gloom has descended on this place with the death of Jackson. Interestingly, another way to judge the far-reaching impact of Jackson's death and how people understood it for what it was, a strategic level inflection point. You know, not just a, the loss of a general, but this was a strategic blow. Uh, in England, uh, one of the major uh, London papers said that assuredly this is the most fatal shot of the war to the Confederates. Uh, and I read that in a couple of different newspapers, a, a similar, uh, similar statement. And throughout the North, there were other interesting quotations. Charles Royster got into the, this a little bit in his book, The Destructive War, uh, and wrote about the impact of Jackson's death uh, uh, throughout the North. Uh, and uh, Oliver Otis Howard, who received the brunt of the attack at uh, Chancellorsville on May 2nd, the flank attack, wrote later on, after his death, General Lee could not replace him, uh, which I think is in a nutshell the truth. Uh, there was no replacement for, uh, for Lee. In 1864, uh, one of uh, Jackson's wartime biographers, there were two wartime biographies of Jackson that came out uh, before the war was over, uh, wrote to uh, 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 Charles Venable, one of Lee's aides, uh, when they were in the siege of Petersburg, and it was late in the siege, and asked for any uh, comments uh, that Venable and or Lee may have had or would have about Stonewall Jackson and his significance. And Venable wrote back in this letter, which had never been looked at by anybody else, and he said, there is not a day that goes by that my chief does not think of that great and good man. Uh, that's a pretty profound statement, and I go into some detail about that in the book. Now, on a very kind of basic and intrinsic so what level, the death of Jackson mean, meant uh, that there would be a massive reorganization. Now, most of you know this, uh, and we know that uh, the two wing system of Longstreet and Jackson, with Stuart serving as the cavalry uh, commander, would be replaced by a three corps system. The reason we care about this, and as I write in my final chapter of the book, the so what of all of this for the course of the Civil War and indeed the fate of the Confederacy is that it's done on the eve of the Pennsylvania campaign that Lee and Jackson had planned. And Ewell and Hill, who had been subordinates of Jackson and were used to his command style, which was very direct, very punctilious, and very certain, had exactly two and a half weeks to get ready for their higher level of responsibility and Lee's command style, which was different. It was mission command oriented, it was intent based, and Jackson and Lee kind of had this going on where they could understand each other's minds, which I illustrate in the last meeting uh, before uh, Chancellorsville, before the, the, the flank march. Uh, and that did not happen with Hill and Ewell and Lee. Uh, they didn't have enough time to be mentored by Lee Jackson is at fault because he didn't mentor them before, of course, uh, but Ewell and Hill didn't have time to adapt themselves to Lee's command style. Obviously, those turkeys will come home to roost on the first and the second days at Gettysburg. Also, Longstreet will return to Lee's side uh, after Chancellorsville, as you know, and he will reassume his position as Lee's number one. But now he's going to think that he's even more significant to Lee uh, than he had ever been before. And in fact, he was because he was the most seasoned Corps commander. Well, that means things when Lee rejects Longstreet at Gettysburg uh, for some of his proposals that we're all very well aware of. Uh, and I think if Jackson had managed to survive and had managed to, to, to live as a one-armed participant in this campaign, we wouldn't have seen Longstreet nearly as prominent. Uh, we wouldn't have seen the elevation of Ewell and Hill. We might have seen one of them. Lee was probably going to divide his army into three corps, uh, but it would have been a different uh, character of the campaign entirely because I, I make a very clear case that Stuart would not have been permitted by Jackson to go on his wild ride because Jackson had wanted and had been complimented by Stuart uh, guiding him on previous campaigns. The two are good friends. I can't think of any reason at all why Stuart would not have guided Jackson's part of the army into Pennsylvania if Jackson had lived. So the reorganization is one thing, uh, 
and all that that meant for the climactic Pennsylvania campaign, but so did the absence of Jackson. So indeed, the ghost of Jackson does still linger over Gettysburg today. And the old cliche, I would argue, is not a cliche at all. It's rooted in reality. And all you have to do is look at Lee's post-war letters to get credence of that. And with that, folks, I'll conclude my final uh, comments and show you this final campaign map as Lee moves north. Uh, but he will not have his great partner, Stonewall Jackson, with him. And that meant all the difference. Thank <laughs> you.